Chief Scientist at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And I'm here to welcome you to our Research Ethics Grand Rounds. At, at this uh, quarterly seminar series, we present uh, groundbreaking empirical research in ethics, as you'll hear today. The format of the seminar is that we have our speaker, Dr. Taylor, presenting for about 35 to 40 minutes. And this is followed by a discussion led by uh, Dr. Galea. And then we have the audience chipping in on uh, chat throughout with questions, and we'll handle those uh, at the end. So without further ado, it's a packed program. I'll briefly introduce uh, Dr. John Samet, who is our uh, former, uh, very recently former Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health, a respiratory physician and epidemiologist who's a professor here and has a long track record of research himself in global health, tobacco control, and uh, pollution related research. So John, over to you to introduce our speaker and discuss it. Great. Thanks, uh, Lisa. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Lauren Taylor, and discussion, uh, Sandra Galea. Lauren is an assistant professor in the Department of Population Health at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, there, she's jointly appointed in the Division of Healthcare Delivery Science and Division of Medical Ethics. Her research interests span both empirical research, describes the world as it is, and normative scholarship that makes a case for how it ought to be. She studies US healthcare through an organizational lens, applying theoretical frameworks from business ethics and political philosophy to managerial and policy uh, dilemmas. Please introduce uh, Sandra Galea, a long-term uh, colleague. Sandra is a physician epidemiologist, a prolific author, and Dean and Robert A. Knox, professor at the BU School of Public Health, a job he took on in 2015. I have to say that uh, Sandra is extraordinarily uh, prolific and widely uh, cited, writing work that uh, I will use his term is consequential. Uh, he's published more than 950 scientific journal articles, numerous chapters, and books, 19 of them. Uh, he has published extensively about the social causes of health, mental health, and trauma. So, uh, Lauren, uh, over to you, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm just sitting here, head in hands, thinking about 950 articles and 19 books. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm especially pleased to have Sandro here as a respondent and discussant. Uh, so let me just share my slides and get us going. Uh, okay. Oh, of course, now it's showing up in the wrong direction. Hold on one minute. Okay. Looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I titled the talk today, 50 Years of Trust in Healthcare, Our Methods Have Deceived Us, and uh, you will see why, but I'm going to give roughly an overview of what I see as the last 50 years of research on trust, uh, owing to a Milbank Quarterly piece that I published in early 2023, just about 10 months ago. Um, and then I'm going to preview a new special report on trust that's forthcoming from the Hastings Center that I've been an editor on and kind of pull out some of the key insights that I think that report collectively achieved. And I'm gonna end with what I'm calling a provocation. And you will see when we get there, it really is a provocation. It is not uh, as fulsome as a new approach or a proposal, but there's something about this literature that just doesn't sit quite right with me. And it's related to the relationship between the theories we're pursuing and the methods we use. And part of the reason that I asked Sandro to be here today is because I see him in addition to being prolific as really a methodological, uh, omnivore. I think he has one of the most flexible and dynamic minds when it comes to matching methods to research interests and theories. And so uh, I'm going to put out a provocation about how we might move forward on studying trust in healthcare. And uh, I'm really hoping that he can uh, not just respond, but hopefully shed some light on how we might implement this idea. Okay, so by way of framing, just situating us in kind of the waters that we swim in, um, there's a ton of discussion about trust right now. 
And I just want to be clear that I think COVID briefly accelerated and brought new attention to a multi-decade multi -decade downward slide uh, in the public's trust in major institutions, including those in health and science. So when I say briefly accelerated, I just want to be kind of as empirical as I can about this. Americans' trust in the healthcare system has been on a downward slide since the late 1960s. Bob London recently published a fabulous piece on this in Dedalius. Uh, all of the public polling is pretty consistent. This is not a new thing. It's not as if COVID broke something that had previously been firmly established and well-rooted. Rather, things were kind of on the downslide and then COVID kind of maybe and briefly um, intensified the trend. I will say the downward slide in healthcare is not unique. It is in keeping with downward slides in trust in virtually all major institutions in the United States, government, Congress, the presidency, churches, uh, even nonprofits to some extent. Uh, so it, we are not unique. But just to zero in on what effect the pandemic really had, this is a poll question from January, 2021. Now we could say we won't have data data, but the poll question was, has the pandemic impacted your level of trust in the healthcare system? And what you see on the slide is that the modal response is people say it didn't. 56% say my trust has remained more or less the same. For 11% of people, it actually increased their trust. And for 32% on the public side, 30% of actual healthcare providers, they say, yeah, my trust was kind of diminished. Uh, note that the people who were most likely to say that their trust had decreased were those who had previously reported already some level of distrust, mistrust, lacking trust. Um, and so, yes, for some portion of the public, the pandemic really shook trust in a negative way, but I wouldn't say that it was everyone. And again, I'm not sure necessarily how lasting that acceleration of the downward trend is going to be. We may look over time and say like, oh, there was a sharper slope to the downward trend for a couple of years, and then it maybe rebounded or it evened out. It's not quite clear. But clearly COVID brought new attention to this phenomenon. You know, it had been happening empirically for many years, but uh, the attention uptick has been quite pronounced. If you look at just kind of PubMed and you think about articles indexed with trust in the title, you can see here, um, again, it's not as if it only happened in 2020, 21, 22, but there's certainly a marked uptick around those years. You can see some of the numbers here at the bottom. And it's just become a splashy term. It's in the vernacular. You know, Ezra Klein wrote this piece back in 2022 about the COVID policy that really mattered wasn't a policy. And if you read the article, it's really his encountering this idea that, oh man, maybe the major misstep in managing the pandemic was not necessarily a strategic or a policy misstep, but it was rather something lacking in the substrate of civil society. So, uh, I and colleagues set out in 2021, probably, uh, in light of this increased attention to say like, okay, what do we really know about trust in health services, health policy? And this was a multi-year endeavor, but uh, I'd like to share a little bit about what we found. We called it a synthetic review because our interest was not in trying to summarize everything that had been written. We just realized very early on that was gonna be impossible. There were ne nearly 750 titles that we reviewed for this um, and we're trying to organize and make some sense of. And we felt like the urgency was not to necessarily do a reductive reporting of what every single paper on trust had found, but rather try and drive towards some kind of insight about what we think we know in a kind of conceptual sense and what we think the kind of best practices would be to the extent that we could glean any. Any. Uh, the Melbourne Quarterly piece that you see on the left-hand side here is open access. So if you want to go check it out, please do. On the right, you'll see a couple of the key takeaways. So one of them is that in the health space, empirical research on trust has outpaced conceptual work. And that's not true in all disciplines. We've actually come across papers in business ethics and management where the opposite is true. And people who do reviews say the conceptual and theoretical work has far outpaced um, the empirical work. But in the health space, empiricism reigns for reasons that we could discuss, and the theoretical work has kind of been lagging. So we've got lots of studies that try and say, if patient X trusts Dr. Y more, 
What are the likely effects? Do they take more steps in a day? Are they more likely to refill prescriptions? Are they less likely to miss appointments, et cetera? This brings me to the second point, which is that lots of the research uh, that is quantitative and is testing some kind of hypothesis or trying to arrive at some kind of association to say nothing of a causal relationship treats trust as an input rather than an output. So again, the examples I just gave were saying, if trust is present or absent, does that make us more likely to see various kinds of outcomes that health services researchers might be interested in? Sometimes it's health outcomes, although rarely, much more likely it's health behaviors like the prescription refill, the missed appointments. And sometimes it's kind of attitudinal, like do people rate their satisfaction higher uh, if they, on the front side say that they trust a clinical team member or a provider. But there's very little work actually out there quantitatively that says, let's treat trust as an output or an outcome of interest. What kinds of things do we need to see or do? What would be the demographic characteristics or behavioral characteristics that actually produce trust or are associated with trust when we take trust to be an outcome? And that's sort of a bummer for us as people who are often approached saying, Lauren, I'm really keen to build more trust in our federally qualified health center or in our hospital or in our clinical team. Can you tell us how to do it? There's not a lot of evidence for me to point to and say, of course, here are the seven, 10, 25 papers that really give you kind of playbook style implications or even strong empirical evidence just descriptively about what it is creates trusting relationships or creates trust in a population. And so we did a ton of work and yet I feel often kind of inadequate in responding to the challenges of the day when people feel like, look, the challenge of the day is building trust. I don't have great things to tell you about necessarily how to do that from an empirical perspective. The last thing I'll say about this uh, 750 paper foray into the trust literature was that um, it can be really difficult despite all of the effort that has been put into studying trust in health and all of the ink that has been spilled on this topic to synthesize as we charged ourselves with doing across papers and across authors because there's often conceptual disagreement about what trust is you'll have one subsection that says trust is really about behavior. We know that someone trusts someone only when we see the revelation of personal information. Others will say, no, trust is an attitude. Others will say, no, trust is a belief. Others will say, no, trust is confidence. And so, you know, you start with what seems like a big number of papers and a decent number even of empirical papers from which to glean insight and then you start to track down like, okay, how should we compare findings in subset A with findings in subset B? And you realize, ooh, it's not at all clear that these are actually measuring the same thing and therefore trying to aggregate or do any kind of meta-analysis to take advantage of the size of this literature can be very, very difficult. Uh, I really set the paper up and we um, wrote the paper to be in part a reference guide. So the first half of this paper is organized around these kind of sub -liter literatures related to the level of analysis and the direction of trust. So the front half of the paper, and it's a long paper, <laughs> uh, goes through sub literature one, two, three, four, five, as you see on the screen and devotes, I don't know, seven to 10 paragraphs or so to each of these relationships. So first we tackled patient trust and clinician and we tried to answer, what do we think we know more or less for sure? What do we think the open questions are? And what do we think the methodological challenges or opportunities are to move this literature forward? And then we took down, as you'll see on the slide, clinician trust and patient. So that's the same relationship, but kind of trust flowing in the opposite direction. We did clinician trust in other clinicians. We did patient or clinician trust in the organization where the organization was really a specific hospital or a specific FQHC or a health system. And then the last kind of sub literature is about trust in the healthcare system. Harkening back to one of the slides I showed you earlier and a lot of Bob London's work uh, frankly dominates that, that area. This is one of the key uh, matrices or graphics that come out of the synthetic review. What you see here is those five levels of analysis that I just described as the rows. 
and the types of papers are kind of oriented on the columns. Dark green means there's a lot of activity. Light green means there's less activity. Note that this is not a um, graphic showing you the value or like how much, um, yeah, how much do we think we really know that is actionable intelligence. This is telling you something about the quantity of research activity, just how many papers are there. So what you'll see is there's a lot of activity and certainly the most dominant realm of activity related to trust is about patients' trust in clinicians. Um, so many, many quantitative analyses, lots of commentaries, of course. I would say the next most popular dyad or relationship is that kind of clinician or general public trust in the healthcare system. Lots of surveys asking people about trust in the US healthcare system. Um, and again, lots of commentaries, many of which have been kind of flurrying forth in the wake of, or while we're still living in the shadow of the COVID pandemic. The middle dyads and directions are considerably less populated, more or less across the board. So clinician trust in patient is a fairly new area that people are starting to take seriously. I'm doing work with colleagues at um, UC Anschutz that is kind of tackling this. Clinician, clinician trust has become more of a, a, a area of activity. A lot of work in academic medicine and other journals like that, specifically actually related to learners, residents, medical students, trying to think about how other clinical team members should place trust in them or not place trust in them. And then the organizational level is like a desert. And as someone who is trained at a business school and is very interested in organizations, uh, it both breaks my heart and gives me great excitement because I think there's a lot of room to run there. But we really know very little about why people trust organizations, how we should conceive of trust in organizations. In some ways, the organizations and the systems level work poses a special problem because historically, our understanding of trust is very interpersonal. We think about it as person A's trust in person B. Um, and our whole idea about what it means to be trustworthy and what it means to be trusted rests on kind of a human trustee. As we start to think more, and I think it's entirely appropriate, but as we start to think more about healthcare being delivered in organizational environs, um, I think that challenges some of our traditional assumptions about what trust and trustworthiness is. And uh, again, there's tremendous room to run, but I don't think there's been a lot that's particularly exhaustive on that topic yet. I just wanted to show you a bit about what I mean when I say there's kind of conceptual muddiness in the trust literature. This is table three, again, from that Milbank piece. And what you'll see is a whole bunch of different quote unquote frameworks for trust. And what I'd like you to just kind of glance over is that third column, the key framework terms. I would say amongst all the different frameworks out there for trust, and there are dozens and dozens, there's about 80% overlap on key ideas. There might be even hearkening up to like 85% key ideas uh, convergence when you're talking at those interpersonal levels, patients trust in clinician, clinicians trust in patient, clinicians trust in clinicians. Everyone seems to agree there's something about an assessment of the trustee's competence that is central to decisions about whether or not to trust. The question is what beyond competence is required or uh, if we think competence is a necessary but not sufficient condition for trust, what are the remaining things that would get us to sufficiency? And you can see here things like honesty, empathy, caring, um, tend to come up again and again, values there at the bottom. So there's some kind of special sauce beyond confidence that folks gesture to, but everyone sort of gestures to it in a slightly different way. I just want to note, and this kind of plants some breadcrumbs for us to pick on later uh, with the provocation, that these frameworks are often developed out of a factor analysis based on survey data or in preparation for survey development to kind of take on the task of doing some kind of validation. Um, and I think that may be problematic, but I'll come back to that. Uh, so given this kind of conceptual muddiness, one of the major things we ended the Milbank paper with was saying like, look, 
this kind of theory development or conceptual muddiness is a major rate limiting factor for our ability as authors, but kind of our in the more biblical sense, uh, our ability to make sense of this literature. And we said, look, there's a couple strategic imperatives that we need to take on, and you'll see some of them here. The exemplary research questions are ones that, you know, even after reviewing 750 papers, I think are kind of wide open. Um, and so that gives you a sense of why I both love this topic and I find it intensely frustrating because sometimes it can feel incredibly circular. Like the more you know, the more you ask yourself, what, if anything, do I really know? So this diagnosis of the current literature, the diagnosis that we offered in the Milbank quarterly piece about the conceptual confusion that remains, is really what spurred the development of this new Hastings Center special report. Uh, this is a special report that is forthcoming. It should be out in the next seven to 10 days. Uh, on the left, you'll see the cover that they kindly lent me for the, for the purposes of this talk. We titled it A Time to Rebuild, Essays on Trust in Healthcare and Science. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the kind of opening essay that I led. The charge for that essay was not so much to do my own uh, or our own novel thinking as it was to kind of, again, synthesize and find some commonalities across the other essays. There were many other essays. I was delighted. I was an editor on this volume and we wound up with 15 essays. Again, you don't need to read these in any detail, but if you want to take a screenshot or you want to follow up with me after, they're excellent and they really range in method and emphasis. Uh, there are essays across the levels of analyses. There's essays about trust in individual healthcare providers, trust in the healthcare system, trust in quote unquote science writ large. And there's a range of methodological approaches in the essays themselves. Some are empirical quantitative, some are empirical qualitative. And I would say probably 60% of them are conceptual or normative in flavor, which has historically been a sweet spot for the Hastings Center. But I will be candid again and tell you, uh, it was difficult, especially when being charged with writing this introductory piece to synthesize or do the crosswalking between these different levels of analysis and authors. So I will share, this was reviewer one's comment or one of the reviewer's comments. There were many and many were quite positive, but this one cut deep. This collection is a bit of a shaggy dog in that the articles are very diverse and I cannot even tell if they're using the same definitions of trust and trustworthiness. It makes it really hard to know what to do with the articles as a series or how a reader would use them. <laughs> so here I am a junior editor, first time doing like a special report or a special issue and I just thought, ooh, uh, and it was one of those critiques that really cuts deep because you know there's a kernel of truth to it. It's not like this person was way off base and you wonder what the heck were they reading. They read the articles just like I did and they were, you know, probably right. So let me tell you, we went back to the introduction on the heels of that initial review and really tried to think hard about what could be gleaned and what could be, you know, I hesitate to say generalized, but really taken from these articles. We also pushed that kind of feedback back out to the individual essay writers and said, you know, we'd really like you to be more precise and in some ways prescriptive about how you're defining these terms and do some crosstalk amongst yourselves if you can. So I think that reviewer considerably strengthened the set. Let me tell you what I think maybe just three insights were that wound up coming into this introduction uh, on the heels of that feedback. The first is to say, uh, trustworthiness, which I think is an easier concept than trust, should be defined as the quality of being deserving of trust. And I think this often just kind of gets overlooked or um, just, yeah, overlooked because people will sort of sloppily assume that trustworthiness is the characteristic of being trusted. But what I wanna say is trustworthiness is an inherently normative concept. There's no escaping it, I think. And the value of distinguishing trustworthiness as the characteristic of being worthy of trust and trust as this more descriptive, someone is either willing to be vulnerable in the face of exploitation or not, is that you can really think about various combinations of these terms. 
So you can think about people trusting trustworthy actors, and you might say, there's no problem there. It's not something that deserves a lot of our scholarly or policy attention because that's good alignment. People are extending themselves, being willing to put themselves in vulnerable situations uh, with trustworthy people. On the other hand, you could think about people not trusting untrustworthy actors, and that too is a fairly good state of affairs. I don't think we want people recklessly extending trust to untrustworthy actors. The challenge are that when are when people do not trust trustworthy actors, that's bottom left quadrant, or people do trust untrustworthy actors. And I would say the bottom left has occupied a lot of kind of public attention, uh, at least in certain spheres of the media and I would say academia on the heels of the pandemic, because there was a lot of concern that like, look, this was a trustworthy vaccine. Tony Fauci is a trustworthy guy. And yet people are seemingly not willing to extend any kind of trust or vulnerability towards those actors. And so a lot of the emphasis on understanding trust and addressing trust has been implicitly motivated by a desire to raise the level of trust in actors or trustees that we assume are patently trustworthy. The less, um, the less, uh, popular trust problem to focus on, but one that I think is no less deserving of our trust, is when people trust untrustworthy actors. This comes through to some extent in the discussion about misinformation um, or disinformation, but that's not always framed quite as much in terms of trust, but I think it is, as you can hopefully see in this two by two, just a mirror image concern. One is people trusting untrustworthy actors, and the other is people not trusting trustworthy actors. But only if we're precise in how we think about the definition of trustworthiness and that normative idea of them being deserving or undeserving of trust, can we kind of see these as two separate and distinct, quote unquote, trust problems. The second insight is that actors that try to build trust without being trustworthy pose an ethical problem. And this was something that I thought was just, again, sort of a sweet spot for a Hastings Center report special issue. Uh, Jonathan Marks, who's a philosopher and bioethicist at Penn State, really nails this, I think, most clearly in his essay. And I think this jives with many of our intuitions, but he lays it out quite beautifully and it's echoed in some of the other essays. To be a healthcare provider or to be a healthcare organization and to say, oh, we got a big trust problem. We want to go out there and build trust and tackle it as sort of a marketing endeavor uh, or a whitewashing endeavor, of course, poses an ethical problem. It's essentially tantamount to lying or being purposely deceptive. And so several of the essays really put the charge to particularly healthcare organizations and health systems to do internal work of evaluating their own trustworthiness before they embark on an effort to win the trust of, let's say, sexual or gender minority populations or black and brown populations, which tend to be two of the populations where people really recognize there's a trust alignment problem most frequently. The third insight is that trust is just unavoidably reciprocal or mutual within a relationship. I trust you the more I think that you trust me. And this came through particularly clearly in some of the analyses, the empirical analyses by Rachel Grob and colleagues, um, and also the one by Tom Lee and colleagues out of Press Ganey, which used some really interesting machine learning techniques to analyze the huge patient data set of kind of comments on the backside of care. Uh, so if I trust you, if I'm more likely to trust you because I think you trust me, and presumably that also goes the same for the other party in a given relationship, this is just a thorn in the side of researchers and practitioners because it makes it like virtually impossible to disentangle my feelings, my state of mind from your feelings and your state of mind. Uh, so let me launch from there into this kind of provocation. I think at least part of the persistent conceptual confusion that I've tried to describe in brief here may be attributable to an inappropriate reliance on specific scientific methods to study trust. 
these methods that I'll say more about in a moment produce data that really lead to a very person-centered concept of trust. But trust might more appropriately be understood as a characteristic of a relationship. And so if we were to make this conceptual commitment, the provocation I'm putting to you here is what kinds of methods and data might we alternatively produce? So this is the whole rest of the talk on one slide and I'll just unpack it for maybe five minutes. This is a graphic from uh, Clay Aldifer's paper back in 1982, I think in Administrative Science Quarterly where he's kind of depicting something that will be familiar to most people who have taken a philosophy of science class or even an intensive and kind of epistemically inclined research methods class. The methods we choose inform the data we collect and greatly shape the data we collect. That data then kind of informs and in some cases produces the theoretical commitments and the theoretical commitments then inform the methods that we subsequently choose. But these are cyclical kind of ideas. We're always in the, in the kind of um, mode of moving amongst method, data, and theory. And what I'd like to say is with uh, trust in healthcare in mind, I think we started with a, method, a methodological commitment. And I think that methodological commitment came from as many things do, sort of living in the shadow of the hard sciences. And so the methods we chose were overwhelmingly survey methods and to a lesser extent, qualitative interview methods. But across those 750 papers that I mentioned in the Millbank piece, if we say something like 450 of them, maybe 500 of them were empirical in some way, I bet 75% of the empirical papers use either surveys or qualitative interview methods. Uh, if we hold aside the qualitative interview methods just for a moment, the methods we've used to study trust are overwhelmingly inclined towards counting things. And we're also battling this perverse incentive, which is, you know, I, I choose or I develop a method to study trust. And then Eric Campbell sees the method that I'm using and he says, oh, that's interesting. But for me to get the next grant, I need to develop my own method or I need to adapt the method or I need to... Uh, you know, somehow differentiate my grant proposal from Lauren's grant proposal. And so you have this institutional pressure, I think, to fragment even our methodological approaches to study and trust. So let me just show you three kind of exemplary measures that are often used to study trust. And I'll say before I put them up here, these are first in class. Like I did not go and try and choose um, lousy methods by any means. If you came to me and you email me after this and you say, Lauren, I have a survey and I really want to study trust. How would you suggest I do it? I would likely point you to one of these three measures. But they, they have a sh similar flavor, although you'll see the differences. They often ask things like, rate how confident you are in the following. You know, how confident are you? This is a, a measure to assess clinician trust in patients. How confident are you that this patient will provide you with all the necessary information? How confident are you that the patient will follow up with the treatment plan you recommend? How confident are you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's rated on a scale, you know, not much to vary, essentially. Another very good, validated, frequently used trust survey technique is to say, rate how frequently, and this is for patients' trust in clinicians. How often did you feel you could tell your doctor any? Thing. How often did you feel your doctor put your best interest first? And how often did you feel your doctor had all the information they needed to diagnose? And that is on a kind of rarely, sometimes, frequently, never, that kind of uh, Likert scale. And then I hope you're seeing the trend here, but rate your strength of agreement with the following uh, statements. And sometimes doctors care more about what's convenient for, their, for them than patient needs. I completely trust doctors' decisions about which medical treatments are best, et cetera, et cetera. And that strength of agreement scale is again a like or I don't at all agree to I very much agree. So the data we get back from those kinds of measures, commonly used, well-validated, total face validity, uh, is the unit of analysis is the individual. And what we get back is patient-centered data from that patient or that person's perspective, 
this is what the trust numbers look like. And because cross-sectional data is so much the norm, we have incredibly sparse longitudinal data related to trust in any of these relationships, but again, a huge area open for running. So it's cross-sectional, person-centered, and individuals are the unit of analysis. The result is we have kind of derived theories or to the extent that we have theories or concepts, they're you know amalgamations of that kind of data. And so our concepts of trust I think are somewhat anemic in health services, health policy, bioethics. Uh, our theories on trust really come from a fairly limited perspective. They're again, muddied by this crosstalk. One person says, oh, trust is a belief. Another says trust is an attitude. Another says trust is a behavior. Another says trust is confidence. And in some ways, like the theories that we wind up with are sort of poorly aligned with our intuition. If you read it, I think you would you would read the literature and say like, but isn't trust so much more than what we've been able to measure there? So kind of in some here, I think we've tried to build a theory of trust um, inductively, which there's nothing wrong with that. But to do inductive work, you really have to be confident that the premises are true. And if the premises are faulty, then inductive reasoning really can let you down. It's sort of a version of this problem that we've got lots of people maybe looking at trust I think they all might be closer to each other than in this picture per se, but they're all getting slightly different pictures and announcing that they have arrived at a concept that probably doesn't fully at least represent the underlying phenomenon. Uh, I just wanna say that in the nature of this being cyclical, we have these sort of anemic ideas about what trust is as a concept in healthcare or health policy. And we are on the verge of doubling down, um, meaning there are people coming to me and other people in the trust world now saying like, trust is really important. We want to take it seriously. We want to put this in HCAPs or other kinds of big standardized surveys, which is a major commitment and in many ways, very exciting. But they'll then say like, is there a single item measure? Can we get to the single item measure? That is the holy grail. And I think that is in some ways like, uh, you know, this phenomenon that I've been describing taken to its natural, um, I don't know about end point, but like highest, uh, highest uh, demonstration. So the provocation is just like, what if we started with a theoretical commitment rather than continuing to try and build inductively to a concept or a theory about trust that is coherent? And I just love this. J.B. Conant was the president of Harvard back in the 50s. He was trained as a chemist, so very bench science, wet lab. Uh, and yet he said, you know, the history of science demonstrates beyond a doubt that really revolutionary and significant advances come not from empiricism, but from new theories. And so uh, I just wanted to kind of posit, what if we, rather than centering ourselves on the methods and proceeding from there, tried to take a pause and say, well, what would happen if we started with a theoretical commitment? And the theoretical commitment that I would just put on the table for consideration, and that's really all I'm doing here, I can't go much beyond that today, is like, what if we treated trust as a characteristic of a relationship rather than something person-centered, an attitude or a behavior or a belief? And then we tried to proceed deductively from there rather than continuing in this inductive loop. I just want to be totally transparent that I have no idea where this is going to lead us methodologically. And in some ways, I feel like I too um, am kind of trapped in a cage of my own making, having been so deep in this literature. It's often hard for me. It is hard for me. I was sitting there this morning giving my little one a bottle in the in the rocker, and I was saying, like, what would a really bold methodological approach be if we were to take trust seriously as an attribute of a relationship? And I have like scattershot ideas, but it's not as if the moonshot is really crystallized. Uh, that's why I'm hoping Sandra will solve this problem for us. So I will leave you with that provocation uh, and turn it over to Sandra for some hopefully reactions and answers. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Lauren. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Really good to see you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, um, I both learned from you and the uh, I was jotting down notes badly, um, uh, mostly in agreement, some not. Um, uh, so um, let me just uh, offer just a couple of comments and then lead with a question. So um, 
Uh, first of all, I thought it was a super interesting presentation, really uh, made me think about uh, things in a structured way in which I have not before. So thank you for that. Um, as you were speaking, and you know, as I'm looking at the at the arc of your talk, you know, you talked about growing interest in trust. You showed us what the literature is that's available on trust. And then you showed us the sort of this really cool two by two table on insight number one about trustworthy, untrustworthy. And then you led to your provocation, which is that we need more theory. That was largely the arc of your thought, of your talk. And as you were doing that, I sort of felt I had to go back and ask myself, so what is trust to begin with? And uh, when I went back to what is trust to begin with, both, I mean, you alluded to this, although I don't think you explicitly sort of underscored it, right? Trust is the belief in the reliability truth of someone or something, right? Someone or something. And when I look at that definition, I think that definition has two components. One is the belief in, and the other one is the reliability truth of the someone or something. And I actually think those two components are quite different and have different drivers. So, so although you spoke about trust, and you know, over and over again, you talked about trust, that's fine, that was, the, that was the theme of your talk. As the more you were talking, the more I couldn't help but see your talk through the lens of, you actually talk about two different things. One is the belief in, and the other one is the trustworthiness or reliability of someone or something. Now, why does that matter? It matters because when it comes to what I thought was the heart of your talk, which was your insight number one, um, uh, where you showed us our two by, your two by two grid and the trustworthy, not trustworthy, people trust, people don't trust. You said a statement, which I'm not sure if you fully meant, but I'm going to underscore it and see if you really meant it. <laughs> um, because you said in the top right-hand corner, when people trust people or systems that are untrustworthy, which you labeled as problematic, I agree. And you said that's where mis or disinformation lies. That's what you said in, in your talk. But if I don't think that's right. I think that's where disinformation lies. I don't think that's where misinformation lies. If if one takes a definition of disinformation as being intentional spread of false information, that is correct in the top right corner, which is where you have non-trustworthy people who are being trusted by people. But misinformation, which I take definitionally as being the misunderstanding information being spread incorrectly, not necessarily malignly, I don't think that that dwells in the top right corner. Now, why does that matter? Apart from, I realize it sounds pedantic. It matters because I come back into definition. Because if, if one doesn't break up the definition into the belief component and in the reliability trustworthiness component, then the mis and disinformation both exist in the top right corner. But if one breaks up the definition, then misinformation, is driven by whatever it is that leads belief, but has nothing to do with the trustworthiness or reliability of the person or system. So as I tie, as I go back to the definition of trust, and then I'm hearing you speak, and you then come around to the sort of really nice content quote and the and the circle about the, sort of the uh, where you have, where you talk about method, data theory, and you make a you make a very compelling case that actually we need more theory. And I'm sold. You 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 sold me on that. I I buy that we need more theory. But then maybe we need more theory that disaggregates these two elements of trust. One is the belief, which is so. Then I would take that to say, what is the theory behind why we believe what we believe? And then there's the, what's the theory behind people being reliable or trustworthy, which are which I I think would be two different elements. So just to sort of then hone in on those, let's talk about the part A and part B. Part, part A, which is sort of, you know, why we believe what we believe. Um, I, I get very much, I'm in full agreement with you about the thinking of trust, not as a person-centered person as a person -centered, uh, characteristic, but it's you characterize it as an element of relationships, which I buy. I might push that even further and say, it's not just about the, um, relationship, but actually about a number of contextual factors that even transcend relationships, meaning that uh, my likelihood, my, my, my proclivity to believe is not just driven by my relationship with you. My proclivity to believe might actually be driven by the fact that I'm more inclined to believe you because you are an academic at a distinguished academic institution, which actually transcends your and my relationship. It is an element of the context in which we, we, we exist. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it just is. So one can imagine perhaps a 
a social ecological perspective on the determinants of what makes us believe or not. That's part A of the definition of trust, and that's conceptual. Part B now is this notion of the truth and reliability of the actor or system in which one trusts. And one can also imagine a theoretical construct that gets at what does the truth, what does truth and reliability mean? Because of course, we know that one can be reliable and be consistently wrong, which makes one not necessarily trustworthy, although that's how we think of it. We also know that we tend to attribute traits like reliability and truth to particular um, uh, persons as characterized by traits that we are biased towards. So I think there is then a whole separate conceptual framing of who it is that we are attributing reliability and, and, uh, tr and truth to. There's issues around, for example, the reliability and truth of experts versus reliability and truth of those with lived experience and how the two intersect. So then a truly comprehensive conceptual frame, conceptual understanding of trust, which is what you're advocating for, and you I'm in agreement with, would need to grapple with conceptual framing on part A of the definition, why we believe, why we don't believe, part B of the definition, who actually is reliable or trustworthy, who should be seen as such, and see how the two come together. And I think if one does that, then it takes your two by two table in insight number one and disaggregates it with much more precision than when I went forward with it. So then just to say one last thing and I'll stop talking. You know, you uh, you were making the case for uh, more theory in um, and you know potentially to precede the methods, and um, and, and and you had uh, you you were you were you were tempered in your critique of the methods, which which is which is appropriate and uh, and uh, very generous of you. Um, um, I'm uh, I, I suppose I I I I might be more more uh, inclined to give the methods a pass because the methods in some respects have to wait for the theoretical development. The fact is cross-sectional not longitudinal. I think we can say that about most things. But I wonder if taking an even a step back further back from where you were in your presentation, disaggregate definitions of trust and thinking about the conceptual frameworks of part A and part B and how the two come together would not be a the most productive way forward, which to then bridge the deductive inductive gap that you left us with. I will stop there because I'd love to hear your thoughts about what I just said. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad you offered those comments. Uh, there's much more there than I can respond to, and I see we've got tons of questions coming in. But briefly, I would just say, uh, you know, your your inclination to break apart the conceptual frame for kind of trust or the belief piece and the trustworthiness or the like, what constitutes a trustworthy actor, feels to me right. Um, I skirted the definition of trust in the front part because I knew at the end I was going to kind of offer this provocation about what if trust is an attribute of a relationship. But I will tell you candidly that the operational definition that we used in the Hastings Center report and the Milbank piece was a willingness to be vulnerable at the risk of exploitation, which is not novel to us. It's it's fairly well trodden. Um, but you're right that it has embedded in it two components. It's about my beliefs and what motivates my beliefs, as well as my assessment of you. And so you could be a totally trustworthy person or physician, but you're wearing a white coat. And I had a prior terrible relationship with someone in a white coat. And so my trust in you is certainly not just a reflection of my assessment of you. Um, it's kind of all of the baggage and context that I bring. Um, so, I, I mean, I will really tell you, and I said some of this earlier, there are days when I think, uh, you know, doing the part A, the part B and part C is all sort of more trouble than it's worth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, trust is kind of a red herring and we should abandon this endeavor. Like I've really thought about writing a little viewpoint piece that's titled Against Trust. And to say it's it's like too muddy a concept and instead we should break down like theoretical models and methodological approaches to studying what makes people believe stuff, full stop. We should... Uh, study, you know, what makes things trustworthy. I'm willing to hold on to that term, like in a normative sense. And then the C part that you mentioned, like what about when they come together, that's what I think is sort of unique and difficult about trust. But like, I stare that in the face and I'm like, I have no idea how to do it. And I don't, I've been thinking about it for a while. So 
I don't know where to go. And I think we should just abandon this and we should go back to simpler terms like confidence, satisfaction, reliance, and on the other side, like trustworthiness. But the whole idea of trust sometimes feels like more trouble than it's worth. Other times I can resurrect it for myself, but um, yeah. And just on your point about like not thinking that the methodological challenges are that difficult, you know, we could go cross-sectional to longitudinal, et cetera. I don't know, like how often do you see a paper, Sandra, that really takes as the unit of analysis a relationship? And like, do, I don't know what methods to like pull off the shelf. If we were to take trust seriously as an attribute of a relationship, you would need to do something very psychological, like ask person A, how much do you trust person B? How much do you think person B trusts you? How much do you think person B thinks you trust them? And then like flip the script and be collecting data from both sides about not only the individual's feeling towards the other, but what they think the other thinks of them, et cetera. It's probably not impossible. I'm sure psychology has kind of paths forward to offer us, but it feels very far afield from what we standardly do at the moment to study trust in health services. Well, let me let me just offer a, a, a reaction to that and then I'll I'll take a couple of questions as I'm seeing them in the chat, which actually some of which reflect some of this conversation we're having. Um, um, I, I think the um, the paper that emerges from this that uh, that you know, Lauren, I think the world would look to you to write would be, you know, breaking down our conceptualization of trust with an eye towards suggesting research directions, right? Because if if one if one buys this part A, B, C construct, maybe, maybe it's not correct, but let's just for a second accept that there's parts A and B and then C, which is bring them together. I can see how you could guide me as an empirical researcher to say, well, to get at A, here are the key questions, to B, here are the key questions, and C, here are the key questions, and the different levels in which they have to be measured. I mean, there are obviously papers that, that uh, quantify relationships and diets and things like that. There are papers that look at context. And I guess I've learned over time that um, when one clearly elucidates the theoretical constructs that we think drive something, let's say health, methods follow. I mean, the perfect example of this, of course, is over the past 25 years, the flourishing of methodological approaches to assess how neighborhood level characteristics affect health, for example. I mean, the earliest papers in the late 80s around neighborhood characteristics that affect health, I mean, they were broadly conceptual and they, and they had methods which would never get published today. That's okay. I mean, that went all the way through the 90s. Then you had things like multi-level met, you know, methods that uh, that emerged and then a whole set of other methods that emerged until you got to a point where there's quite a bit of sophistication in understanding how group level, geographic group level characteristics uh, matter for health over and above the health of the individual. And I think it was, it was hard in 1988 to anticipate where the full set of methods over the next 20 years was going to be. And I think similarly, it's hard to imagine that now in trust, but the first steps are to articulate what is the construct that we're trying to get at um, to lead those who are methodologically inclined to, to then do it. And I suppose I did not hear enough in your talk to convince myself that the right approach is quantitative or qualitative or mixed. I'm not sure. I'm also not sure that we need to determine that today. I actually feel like um, we need to first articulate what the constructs are we're trying to measure and the questions that could go towards those. Awesome. So let, should I, let me pull a couple of questions from the chat. Is that okay? Um, yeah. uh, I see from Mel Anderson, which I think actually gets a little bit at this. You know, is it important in your mind to consider trusting relationships as inherently contextual, right? Which is, I think is part of what we're, we're getting at, particularly willingness to be vulnerable um, in proportional to potential harms. Um, I think this reflects a little bit what we're saying that if you want to take part A of the definition, right? The belief part, it definitionally has to be contextual. I think your example of the white coat is perfect. So I don't know if you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I, I mean, just to say that, and this is where, you know, you've got part A, part B and part C. It's tough to totally assess my beliefs independent of questions about the context and what you're asking me to believe in. You know, like you can ask people and general social survey, world value survey does ask people, you know, in general, something like, um, would you say that you need to be very careful who you trust or people, uh, people can mostly be trusted or you need to be very careful who you trust. And that's considered like the stock question about people's individual proclivity to trust or not trust. But then, you know, the context point is, is well taken. I might trust Sandro to 
be my internal medicine doctor and I might not trust him to change the muffler in my car. And so both the task and the context in which I meet him greatly influence my trust. Uh, similarly, the, the idea of trying to take trust as an attribute of a relationship is somewhat trying to address that because it takes a lot of the quote unquote context and makes it a group level um, identity. So I might trust Sandro more because he's a male if I've had prior engagements with males that are positive and I might trust him less because he carries that group identity if I've had historical experience that's not positive. And to think about trust as an attribute of a relationship basically tries to take that context, which is often just kind of depicted as a, a dotted line around an otherwise fairly interpersonal model. And then it's like, oh, just kind of kitchen sink it. Just put a dotted line around the whole thing and call it context and internalize it to say, we can we can think about those contextual factors as part of the trust or our trustees group identities and the concordance or lack thereof between them. Well, I think the good news and the bad news is that it's not one paper now, it's four papers. One is laying out A, B, C. Then it's a paper about A, paper about B, a paper about C. Um, uh, and I look forward to reading all four. And just to be clear, one should never trust me with changing the muffler on anybody's car. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Megan Robbins introduces another element, which um, actually we haven't discussed, and I didn't hear you mention in your presentation, which is the element of time. I actually think it's a, it's a, it's a really important point about time frame. Like you know, when we talk about these things, perhaps just due to limitation of our language, we, 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 there's always an, an an assumption that we're talking about X and Y being temporally linked. Well, in fact, we know, of course, that X and Y sometimes are separated by months, years, and decades. Any comments on that, Lauren? Only to say that one of the things we pulled out in the Millbank case was the need for longitudinal assessments here, because we have no idea how trust moves over time. In the all the papers we reviewed, I think there might have been two or three papers that took repeated assessments of trust at different points in time. Um, so amen to the fact that this is an oversight in the literature. I would love to do this work. It's just incredibly work intensive and it's expensive, you know, like to me, it's calling out for a longitudinal cohort study where you're repeatedly talking and measuring trust in various system, provider, et cetera. Um, and that's not a like $50,000 foundation grant. That's a $500,000 NIH grant. Hmm. I'm aware of the time. I think we will have time for one more question. I apologize to people whose questions I didn't get to because I want to then turn it over to Professor Barrow again. Um, I'll take just this one from um, Alyssa Newman, who I think... Uh, um, alights on this issue, which actually you just hinted at, uh, Lauren, which is uh, you say, you know, you may trust me as a man because you've had positive experience with men, or you may not trust me as a man because you've had negative experience with men. And, you know, there's literature in this, particularly, of course, about minority groups and different identity groups. Your insights on how one breaks that, I really think it's a really interestingly framed. I mean, how does one break these cycles, these belief cycles that may be fixed to particular reductionist, simplistic identities that get in the way of really realizing the potential of the A and the B together to become C. Yeah, I'm just seeing this comment in the, in the chat as well. Um, I will say another reason that I'm inclined towards trying to provoke us to think about trust as an attribute of a relationship is out of a concern that the mistrust literature, particularly focused on racial minorities, has a, a sensibility that wants to internalize mistrust to certain communities. Oh, black people are mistrustful. Uh, no, they're not. Oh, gender minorities are mistrustful. And it gets to a certain like essentializing or very reductive conception. Rather than saying that certain kinds of patients are mistrustful of certain kinds of systems that both come with history and come with identities that are potentially um, really poorly aligned, you know. So um, how do we fix it? Uh, I don't know. One very pragmatic strategy is I think there's two ways to build trust. One is for the trustee to actually do some genuine reform of themselves to become more trustworthy and then to communicate that clearly. That takes time and it's very difficult to communicate from a place of historical mistrust, so it's tough. The second strategy that you see a lot is people who are not trusted or institutions that are not trusted tend to try and borrow trust from actors that are trusted. So this is the kind of community health worker approach. I, as Mass General Brigham, don't have a reputation in Jamaica Plain that's awesome. So I 
create a community of community health workers who are going to go out, they will be trusted ambassadors. And essentially, I as an institution get to borrow some of the trust that they have historically had with the community. So I think the two strategies are kind of build and borrow. Uh, the borrow is probably faster, but the build is probably the longer term institutional fix. Lauren, it's a uh... Really a delight hearing you present and an honor to um, have this exchange. Thank you for inviting me. Professor Biro, over to you. Great. Thank you, Lauren, for a very stimulating talk. And I can see from the chat that there's a lot of uh, people who may be following up with you after the, the seminar. And I, I'm one of them because I have a, uh, I want to talk about our work on trustworthy studies. But thank you very much. And I also saw from the chat that people think you not only have uh, ideas for at least four papers, but five grants. So you're going to be very, very busy over the next few years. And Sandra, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that uh, stimulating discussion and great audience participation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple months at our next seminar. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.